Good afternoon, DEC members, and I hope your week is off to a great start today. I'm Steve Gregorian, President and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. And if you haven't already, please mute your audio and your video. A couple of quick announcements before we get started. I want to take a brief moment to thank the 120 terrific DEC sponsors for their continued support of our mission. Also, be sure to get your ticket for our next two upcoming speakers. We just announced yesterday that on October 28th, we'll be hosting Larry Kudlow, and he will share his thoughts on the economy. And then November 11th, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, Alex Gorski, will be with us. And as you know, his company is racing for a COVID vaccine. I also wanna offer a special welcome to college and high school students today who are always near and dear to the DEC. Today, we are joined by students from Schoolcraft College, University of Windsor, Melvindale High School, and Utica Eisenhower High School. Here's the format for today's meeting. I will interview our speaker for 15 to 20 minutes. And for the final portion, we will get to questions that you submitted via email. And we also want you to submit some more questions real time via the chat room. And the DEC has an incredible history of speakers we love to share. Before today's meeting, we have hosted 12 other speakers as far back as 1934. And today we're pleased to add Charles Evans is our 13th speaker on this day in DEC history. So let's get started. Charlie Evans has served as president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago since September 2007. In that capacity, he serves on the Federal Open Market Committee, which is the Federal Reserve System's monetary policy making body. Mr. Evans has taught at the University of Chicago, University of Michigan, and the University of South Carolina. <clears throat> Excuse me, he received a bachelor's degree in econ from the University of Virginia and a doctorate in econ from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. It's his second visit to the DEC with his first one being in person in 2014. So Charlie, great to see you again and thanks so much for being with us. Well, thanks Steve, thanks for that warm welcome and it's uh, good to join you. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person but I do remember our, uh, my visit in 2014, it was very nice and I think it's very special when you uh, have the high school and college students there too. I remember that and I hope that uh, today we have a, uh, a good session and uh, everybody enjoys it. Thank you, Charlie. Well, let's get into it. I thought first we could start with some local context. Can you just tell us about the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, the role it plays in our economy and your branch right here in Detroit? Absolutely. So the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, I think of it as the uh, uh, Midwestern district of the Federal Reserve System. We've got 12 banks scattered around the country and we service uh, five states. We include uh, the larger parts of uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, Illinois, Indiana, and the entire state of Iowa. We have a branch in Detroit. We've only got one branch. Um, many uh, of the reserve banks have more uh, branches, but we've got one in Detroit and uh, it has a large uh, cash operation. They uh, are distributing uh, cash to anybody, uh, to the uh, banks who come uh, and, and, and service that. We've also got some bank examiners who are stationed out of the branch. And we also do economic uh, intelligence, monitoring of economic conditions, which is something we do around the entire district. So that, that's a very important function. Um, you know, I take that information to Washington for our Federal Open Market Committee meetings where I talk about what conditions are in the Midwest and also around the country as we think about the best setting for monetary policy. Uh, in the Federal Reserve, we have uh, bank examiners uh, throughout the five states. We've got community banks that we supervise, regional banks, large banks, and some uh, foreign banks as well. So it's really quite an operation. We also have uh, provide financial services in terms of uh, ACH and uh, wire transfer and other things. So it's uh, really an exciting place uh, to work. If anybody, any of the students are interested in career opportunities, we, uh, you know, we're a great place to work. It's an awesome building. I've had occasion to be there a couple of times and it's phenomenal here in Detroit. Let's get your thoughts on the economy. Uh, can you briefly describe where the recovery stands today and how you expect the economy to evolve over the next few years? Right, so, um, 
it's a it's a very challenging time, obviously, and I'm not going to belabor what we've been through already. But uh, sort of the short version of this is because of the pandemic and the virus, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, lockdowns, and people just not being comfortable going out and doing commerce. We saw economic activity fall by more than 30% annualized in the second quarter. Well, we're rebounding now in the third quarter as people have opened up, they feel a little more comfortable and a lot of businesses have figured out how to work uh, in this uh, challenging environment. So we're looking for growth to be about 30% up. Now, unfortunately, the magic of uh, percentages is 30 down and 30 up doesn't get you back up to whole. So we're at about 91%, we still got a ways to go. Um, but it, it's a very uneven recovery in the sense that uh, there are advantaged sectors that don't have to deal with end users, uh, customers, um, manufacturing firm, for instance, a factory, they can figure out how to socially distance, be careful, um, not expose their workers to the virus and then make their product and get it out. Um, uh, business services, uh, corporations, uh, I'm working remotely from home and, and you know much of our staff and many people are doing that, they have that advantage too. But the disadvantaged sectors are the ones where you deal very uh, intimately with uh, customers, entertainment, travel, leisure, hospitality, and so they've really been hurt. That's gonna be a longer slog to get back. Uh, I'm somewhat optimistic about the recovery next year. I think that under you know a good set of circumstances that the unemployment rate at the end of 2021 could come down to about five and a half percent. Now that's really a good showing considering you know we were up at 14% unemployment not long ago. We're just under 8% at the moment and a lot of what I'll be looking for is in the spring, what does the momentum look like in the labor market? Are we gonna see continued improvement in employment and downward movement in unemployment, or is it perhaps gonna stall? And I think that the state of fiscal policy could play an important role for that. Maybe we could talk about that a little bit later. Um, I also um, a little nervous about inflation. We've been underrunning our inflation objective for some time, and I think it's gonna be a bit uh, of a challenge to get it up to 2%, but that's sort of a thumbnail sketch of where I think we are now. Thank you. Let's turn to monetary policy. We know the Fed has a dual mandate to one, promote the goals of full employment and price stability too. Recently, the FOMC made substantial changes to its statement on longer run goals and monetary policy strategy, which explains how it defines and expects to achieve those dual mandate objectives. Tell me what prompted these changes? Yes. So, um, I have had the high honor of being the uh, president of the Chicago Fed for the last 13 years. I've been with the Federal Reserve coming up on 30 years as an economist. And I would say the things that prompted us are the fact that it is just so much harder to conduct accommodated monetary policy in the current environment than it was in the, in the 80s and in the 90s and even in the early 2000s. And so there's been a uh, a worldwide trend towards lower interest rates, which has led naturally to interest rates in the United States being lower. And that means that we have less capacity to cut interest rates, to provide accommodation, accommodation when it is necessary as we're going into a recession. And so, you know, the way that monetary policy works is we cut interest rates, borrowing becomes a little cheaper, the reduction in customers going into the showroom to buy cars. All of a sudden, more people are pulled in and we get more demand and the economy can grow. Back in 2008, we reduced interest rates all the way to zero by December of 2008, and they were at zero for eight years. And we had a hard time providing accommodation. Um, and we just recognized that we hit the effective lower bound so much more readily in this, this day. We have to be aware of the effective lower bound. We have to take actions ahead of that. We need to be careful not to prematurely raise rates um, because we're worried about inflation when we've had trouble getting inflation up to 2% and, and beyond. And so we, we indicated that uh, we're looking, we have the dual mandate, but you know, we focus on eliminating shortfalls. Maximum employment is our objective and there's really no level of employment that is too high. If anything, vibrant labor markets bring more people into labor markets and improve everybody's opportunities. And so we don't wanna prematurely short circuit an expansion unless we see inflation at an unacceptable level. Then of course we'd have to take action, but we have not seen anything like that for quite a while. So it was this realization that things are just so much harder in the current low interest rate environment that we needed to sort of clarify how we were gonna act in the future. 
Carol, you mentioned inflation rates. Let's get into that a little bit. Um, the Fed has been underrunning its 2% inflation objective for many years. Uh, why is it so important to get inflation to 2% since it's often been as close as one and a half to one and three quarter percent? That's true. I mean, you know, we, we sort of focus on two and isn't one and three quarters close enough. And I would say a lot of times it might be close enough. If we had previously been at two, if we'd been above two, then, you know, you're never going to be able to fine tune it all that well. But we've had times where we've been below 1% and we've struggled to get it up to one and a half. And, and, and one thing is we've just sort of promised everyone that our objective is 2% and we really need to follow through on that commitment to 2%. Now that's important to borrowers because just think about somebody going out to buy a house for the first time. I remember that. And you sort of stretch, you know, you take out a mortgage that's a little more challenging and the person lending you the money in your real estate broker kind of says, that's okay, you can afford it because your income is gonna grow. You're gonna be successful, you're gonna grow into it. And sure enough, your wages grow and all of a sudden that fixed mortgage payment becomes more manageable. Well, part of that is inflation is supposed to be what it's promised to be, 2%. If it's only zero, then that's two, per two percentage points on wage growth that you're not gonna be getting. Your mortgage payment's gonna be more onerous. And so borrowers are just challenged. Now, creditors, of course, you don't want inflation to be above 2% in a way that it wasn't expected, but there's already an inflation premium in there to compensate for that. And if anything, our entire experience recently has been that inflation has just underrun this and the cost of borrowing, I think, has been higher because of that. So I think that's why it's important. It does seem like it's a trivial amount. It's only a quarter of a point. What's the big deal? But on the larger, in the larger context, it has a lot to do with how we can conduct monetary policy. And we would just have less room to cut rates if we don't follow through and get it to 2%. That's a great explanation. Thank you. Fed Chair Powell and the FOMC's summary of economic projections seem to signal very clearly that the FOMC does not expect an increase in the Fed funds rate to be appropriate until sometime after the end of 2023. That's a long time. Is that consistent with your view? That is a long time. So, um, you know, uh, Chair Powell has uh, commented about our summary of economic projections that each FOMC member makes a submission for. And it looks as if uh, almost nobody is expecting the short-term policy rate, the federal funds rate, to start increasing before 2023, actually into 2024. Now, why is that? Well, we've said most recently in our, after our September meeting that we're going to keep it at zero and we're expecting we're going to have to provide accommodation to get maximum employment. So we need to get that unemployment rate down to that five and a half percent and lower that I mentioned earlier. Accommodation will help. We need to get inflation up to 2%. And we indicated that we kind of expect it to stay at zero to a quarter point until we see inflation get to two, I would say sustainably, and unemployment come down quite a lot. According to our forecast, we just think that it's going to be 2023 before we get inflation to 2%. Now, then after that, we said we're still going to be accommodative as we begin to gently, slowly increase short-term policy rates after that. It will still be accommodative. It won't be as high as, you know, the 25 to 3%, you know, neutral rate or something. So we've got quite a lot ahead of us. There are other uh, actions that could take place that would help if more fiscal policy was forthcoming, that would help and that type of thing. So, um, you know, when the Fed has to do a lot that, you know, that, that, that we end up with these lower rates for longer. Charlie, I've got one last question for you before we go to the audience. And I'm going to remind our audience here, if you've got a question for Charlie, please use the chat box and send that in and we'll, we'll take a look. But you talked about unemployment, jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, any thoughts on when you expect unemployment could be below 5% again? So like I said, I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic that next year the economy is going to continue to uh, advance, that momentum will be good, that the labor market will continue to rebound. And I think, you know, employment growth uh, should be stronger. And um, I expect the unemployment rate to end next year at about five and a half percent. I expect that to continue. So I think that in 2022, we should get down to about 4%. I don't see why we can't continue to improve beyond that, unless inflation all of a sudden started taking off 
well above 2%. And I just don't see that uh, being in the cards. We have learned that as we pushed, as it, you know, as the economy produced more jobs, unemployment down to three and a half percent, more people came into the labor market. People who previously didn't have as strong an attachment to the workforce, all of a sudden they were able to find jobs, they increased their attachment, they gained skills. And that's really beneficial for the future because that's a more skilled workforce, um, more experience, they can move around and businesses benefit from you know, having access to that uh, greater, more accomplished workforce. And so that's just really good for the US economy, for Michigan. And you know, we hope to get back there before too long. Thanks, Charlie. You ready for some audience questions? Yes, please. Okay, I'd like to turn this over to DEC board member Sandy Pierce. She's the chairwoman, Huntington, Michigan, private banking and regional banking director. She also sits on the board of the Detroit branch of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago and is a terrific supporter of the Detroit Economic Club. Take it away, Sandy. Thank you, Steve and Charlie. Really appreciate you joining us today with all of your insights. We have a couple of email questions. I'm going to start with those and then try to get to a couple in the chat box. So you talked about the Fed funds rate near zero and staying there for quite a while. Let's talk about how the Fed can best provide additional accommodations. Should the Federal Open Market Committee use its balance sheet or would negative interest rates be better? <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the, the thrust of this question is absolutely correct. We could provide more accommodation. The way that we did in uh, 2010 and 2012, we could buy uh, more assets than we're currently doing. Now, I will say we are already purchasing $120 billion of assets every month. And so that's really a substantial pace. It's larger than what we did during the open-ended QE3 that started in 2012, but we could do more. We could do it faster. Um, at the moment, though, I think that the current economic situation is really quite different than it was um, during the previous economic cycle. This is a real shock. This is a public health safety shock. This is a lot about confidence of consumers, households, businesses being able to go out and do commerce. And we really need fiscal and public health authorities to be uh, supporting and improving you know, the economic environment, the, 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 the entire environment, so that people can feel confident. And monetary policy can help, you know, uh, cheaper borrowing will help. But if people are nervous about going out and undertaking commerce, that, that's a problem all by itself. And so that's why I keep coming back. And it's kind of counterculture. We don't usually talk about fiscal policy being so important, but this is a very unusual recovery. And so I think that's why that's more important than say these additional forms of monetary policy accommodation. But I do think that eventually we could, you know, perhaps be uh, doing more accommodation. It would probably be more like asset purchases. There aren't, um, uh, my colleagues have talked about negative interest rates because we get this question all the time and there's really not a lot of appetite. Um, I think there are a lot of questions as to their effectiveness. And what's really important is that everybody think that, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve is in it to win it, that we're gonna deliver you know, strong enough inflation, better economic conditions, and, and that by itself is important. Thank you, Charlie. You know, the Fed Chairman Powell recently warned that without additional federal help, economic pain would be prolonged. What do you think happens if we don't get another significant stimulus package? Um, that really makes me nervous about that. I mean, I, I worry about uh, state and local governments and their ability to, now they have to run balanced budgets. They're not like the federal government that can run deficits. So when you run a balanced budget, you're a business person, you understand this very well. The bottom line dictates uh, how you can go forward. And so I worry that state and local governments will cut employment uh, perhaps substantially that would reduce demand, that would uh, lead to a more prolonged uh, downturn, more permanent job losses. And so I worry about that a lot. Now I have heard reports that, um, you know, perhaps the tax revenue situation isn't quite as dire for many uh, state and local governments because uh, services um, production is held up and that's not really taxed at the same, uh, you know, levels. So I, I th I, Good, I'm sorry, it's exactly the opposite of what I said. Goods, goods production has held up you know, really quite well. And so the tax revenue is coming in for that. Uh, you know, it could be better than, than what I'm thinking. But I am worried about uh, the lack of fiscal support. 
we, we kind of saw this movie before in 2011 and 2012 when government spending was a lot weaker and uh, we had a whole bunch of things going on, but that contributed to a slower recovery, certainly compared to the 1980s. 1980s was a period of very strong government spending. And um, you know we had much stronger growth during that time. One more question from the emails and then I'll go to a couple of the chat questions if we have time. Would inflation rising to two and a half or even two and three quarters percent concern you? And do you consider that range to be moderate? Oh, that is a loaded question. That's a very um, uh, insightful one because the word moderate um, is always up for grabs. I would say that two and a half to two throughout two and three quarters percent inflation, you know, by itself, one year, that doesn't bother me. I wouldn't like to see sustained two and three quarters percent inflation. Although I will say that that's not really high. It's not 3%. Uh, um, we have experienced 1% inflation and one and a quarter percent for quite some time. So if you're in the game of averaging 2%, you know, a two and a half or a two and three quarters will get you to an average of two a lot quicker. And then maybe we'd be in a, in a better place. Is that moderate? I think that's going to be in the eye of the beholder. I know, um, you know, a lot of people have sort of said, well, it sounds like maybe a quarter of a point to me, you know, we could get into the semantics game. That sounds like modest, moderate, but I, I mean, okay. I'm not, I'm not tremendously bothered by those, those inflation rates. Let's go to the chat room for a minute. Cause there's some interesting questions in here in five to 10 years. Do you see paper, slash coin currency has a future in the US with most people using credit debit as well as the current coin shortage? Um, you know, paper financial services, the you know, demise has been forecast for those for a very long period of time. There's still some people using paper checks. In fact, businesses use paper checks. Cash has a tremendous benefit over many other forms of payment given its anonymity. Um, I think that uh, you know there's been a lot of discussion about digital currencies, uh, you know, digital financial transactions like what you're talking about. Certainly, they are very easy with online purchasing. That is clearly the way to go. I would certainly expect the cash transactions to be uh, going down over time. But I do think that um, you know anonymity is just an important. Uh, property that a lot of people really want in transactions, and that would be hard uh, to get rid of completely. But yeah, I, I do see a move to uh, uh, online transactions uh, much more. And in fact, the Federal Reserve is about to um, embark upon providing a real-time payment uh, service, which is not a credit product, but would be an actual payment service. And so we're in it to help uh, you know, the banking system, financial system uh, make that happen uh, sooner. I was just going to say that, Charlie, and when will that be available? Uh, we are um, feverishly developing that product. It is a real-time gross settlement product. It is uh, perhaps as early as, I, I think it's 2023, and we're hoping to accelerate that as best we can. It will be a, um, you know, sort of a stripped-down product to get it, you know, in service quickly, and then we'll add bells and whistles as it, it begins to take off. But I'm hopeful that uh, the banking system will find that uh, to be a useful aspect along with, uh, you know, other providers who uh, have, have products as well. Okay, next chat question. What do you make of the fact that some jobs may be gone permanently? How will that change the rate outlook and could it possibly take longer than 2023 to see an increase? Um, I think that's a very big risk. Um, I think that if you look at the success of the labor market over the last few years, it brought more people into the workforce, um, you know, lower wage jobs to get your foot into the labor market and then work your way up. But, um, you know, the disadvantaged services that I were, uh, sectors that I was talking about, restaurants, uh, entertainment, travel, you know, a lot of those have, uh, you know, lower skilled, lower wage workers. And if those jobs aren't going to come back at the same level, then which sectors are going to pick up the slack? Where are they going to be? A lot of people are in urban metropolitan areas. Are people going to want to relocate? Um, are they going to distance a little bit more in their future social lives? I, there's just so many uncertainties in this. But uh, 
you know, job creation, a lot of it is in large metropolitan areas. And so we need to fix this. We need to solve the public health safety questions so that we can let the normal evolution of labor market dynamics work its way through because businesses are innovating. Um, you know, the you know, online transactions, we're learning that uh, brick and mortar retail was always gonna be challenged going forward and that's accelerated now. Is it gonna come back? How much, in what fashion? A lot of shopping malls out there, a lot of office buildings, uh, not fully uh, staffed at the moment. It's a lot of challenges. Thank you, Charlie. Okay, let's let's talk about the federal debt. This is from the chat room as well. How much of the federal debt is held by U.S. versus foreign investors? Is this a problem for us? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I don't have those 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 uh, details readily available. I mean, a lot of debt is you know some portion of debt is held you know overseas, and for quite some time uh, there was a lot of talk that uh, China held a lot of U.S. treasuries because we ran a trade deficit, and so they ended up holding uh, U.S. treasuries. I think they've rebalanced that away from just U.S. dollar-denominated uh, assets, and I think that they've also uh, been paying some of that down through uh, reduced trade activity. So uh, there's been a lot of movement, but the dollar is a vehicle currency for the world. We benefit from that, and so that means that there is a lot of debt held by uh, foreign interest uh, abroad because they need U.S. dollar assets so that they can sort of fund all of their commerce type of activity. So that by itself is not a problem. I would say that, you know, the level of uh, interest rate burden that the government would face in order to keep current on, you know, making these uh, inter uh, debt payments and then getting that down to a reasonable level, that could become, you know, a challenge. At the moment, interest rates are low, and so it doesn't look like that's a, a burden. But you never want to see debt, you know, get to some you know, excess level. We never quite know what excess means. There is a lot of demand for high quality assets, which U.S. debt is. There are a lot of factors in play, but everything else equal, you'd rather have less debt, you know, than more. So, you know, I'd like to get a better handle on that. But at the moment, we've got a lot of problems and, you know, we really need the fiscal support. So I don't think this is the time to all of a sudden turn to uh, getting overly concerned about uh, the debt. I'm going to end with one more question, Charlie, that you've been a, our Fed president during the 2008 financial crisis. You have been our Fed president through the 2019 global health crisis. Compare the two and tell us why we should be optimistic. Um, they are very different. 2008 was a financial crisis. There was, you know, excessive amount of leverage and a lot of other, you know, things. And so um, that sort of colored uh, what the response needed to be. And I think monetary policy was a big part of responding to that. I think more fiscal policy could have been helpful then. Now it's very different. It's a very real shock. It's, it's only financial because of the, the effect of the real public health safety uh, concerns. Financial markets have come back. Um, in, a, in a pretty strong fashion. So really the, the, the challenge ahead of us is to make sure that everyone feels safe. They can go about their lives in a normal fashion. We can return to the same activities that we did before. I mean, travel, travel is down so much. That's a substantial part of the economy. That's what a lot of people look forward to. There are a lot of jobs that um, you know, take place around those activities. And so getting back to you know, normal means we need to uh, be able to make sure that people can be safe. Um, you know, beyond that, I think that you know, optimism comes from our innovative uh, spirit, entrepreneurial spirit, the fact that you know, people want to be um, engaged in you know, useful, worthwhile uh, work. And you know, that's, that's, what, that's what everybody wants. And um, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic for the future, but we have got a lot of challenges. And there are a lot of challenges around the world too. So we, we kind of need to figure all this out together, I would say. Thank you, Charlie, so much. I appreciate it. I'm gonna turn it back over to Steve. Steve? Thanks, Andy. It's great to see you again. Thank you, Sandy. Charlie, very informative conversation. A huge thank you. Uh, keep up the great work. It's very important work that you're doing, but we appreciate your insights, your time today. Thanks to Sandy Pierce for her role in today's meeting. We want to have both of you, Charlie and Sandy, live and in person one day in the future when it's safe to do so. So 
Thanks again Absolutely. to both of you. Looking forward to it. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Finally, thanks to my team and to all of you for being with us. Hope to see you next Wednesday when we host Larry Cutlow. Goodbye and have a great day.